Welcome everyone. I would imagine a few people will, <clears throat> will join us gradually. But I'm so pleased to welcome Dirk Futz of Cobra Grun. He's also teaching BA program in Utrecht, teaching IT and remote sensing and geospatial techniques. And today he's going to talk on uh, the Boma Monitor and urban tree monitoring. It's a subject that I find incredibly fascinating. And I think also the scholars from Sustainable Landscapes will also be very interested. So I'm just going to give you the floor. Welcome, Dirk. Thank you so much. That's, I appreciate that. So yeah, that's true. I, um, I do teach at uh, Novi University. But that's not the reason why we talk today. I talk, uh, we talk today because of my day job, so to speak. And that's um, I work for a company called Cobra Kroeninzicht, where we try to have insights into all the green space of the Netherlands and Western Europe. Um, I guess you don't know me, so for that reason, I have a very small bio. And that's, uh, I have a background in geoinformation and land surveying. Um, and I've been working in GIS, so Geographic Information Systems, for, for a long time, uh, especially in the defense and oil, oil industry. Um, I live in seven countries on four continents. And um, uh, so I am really the last person to speak about trees to you, frankly. Um, I don't know much about trees, um, but I do know an awful lot about uh, satellite images and aerial photographs and what you can uh, take from that to, about trees. Um, so I switched to Cobra two years ago. Work here now. I didn't make that career move because I wanted to get rich. Uh, I did it because I believe in uh, the possibilities to have a good overview over what is green and how it is developing through time. And uh, I had a long chat with the uh, director of uh, Cobra. I told him that at some point I will measure or I will model how happy people are in, in cities. And um, for that reason, he said, well, that's cool. I'll give you a job for that. And so I'm the head of the remote sensing team within our company, uh, which is an eight person uh, uh, group. And uh, I'm part of the managerial advisory board. And OK, so this, this is probably my, my biggest link with, uh, with the trees. I do hike an awful lot. Uh, I love hiking. So the Hoge Veluwe that I just saw passing by in the previous uh, presentation has a few um, secrets to me. I get there. Uh, I go there a lot. But yes, I um, I hardly know anything about uh, about trees, uh, which is kind of stupid, of course. But uh, yeah, so the, the story that I had is I'm going to measure happiness, and of course, uh, uh, this is sort of my level when it comes to trees, right? This is this is my uh, cup of tea, this I understand. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, so I promised I will, I will measure happiness. And if you measure happiness, then you need to look at the human values that come with, uh, with green, urban green, you know, what, what green means to, to people. And um, the RIVM, the Rijksinstituut Volksgezondheid en Milieu, or the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, uh, they sort of cut that up in, 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 in uh, nine, I think. Um, and they, they consider the social values of green, so it provides interaction. You can go to, into a park and meet people. You, there is integration. <laughs> ah, okay, Kristen, do you have a cat? I have a dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the accessibility is enhanced because of green. Uh, so those are social values. And then there are these cultural values where people think of their city and their identity that they take from it uh, based on green. And uh, knowledge development is one of the bigger importance in there. There are certain economic values, of course. It provides employment. Uh, you can consume stuff. You have this apples to, to be picked. And uh, yeah, this, so you can consume nature. It has an added value on the value of land and real estate. Uh, your house becomes um, more valuable because you've got the gigantic, big, beautiful tree in front of your house. Um, and it, 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 it helps the image of a certain city to, to, to be a green city. It really helps. So those are economic values. And then the last one are the human values. It provides physical health. Green helps you to remain healthy. And it helps you to uh, remain stable, yeah. mental health. And finally, it provides safety. So those are the, what is it? I didn't really count them ever. Uh, what is it? Ten, ten different. Um, uh, no, 12, oh, there you go. 12 different uh, human values that you can, can take from, from uh, urban green and the reasons why they are important to humans. And of course, we're rather self-centric as humans, so uh, we first look at ourselves. Okay, this is, why, this is why we go for green. 
Now, the next thing that they, they modeled is um, all, the, all the green provides us ecosystems, ecosystem services, I need to say. So, for instance, I see there is the, I'm not going over all of them, but there are some regulating services. And the second one is interesting, for instance, uh, trees provide cooling. So they, they, they cool the city. Um, and uh, and in, in return, that cooling turns into a value uh, where uh, humans are more healthy because of that. But there's a lot of that. It's a carbon sequestration. We already talked about that. Water storage, uh, plague suppression, pollination, um, the, the cleaning power of trees and, and the urban green. So there's a lot of stuff like that. And then there are production services. It provides us with food. It provides us with biomass. We already talked about that in the previous presentation. Um, almost the last one, cultural services, provides recreation, natural heritage, and then the, the last one, because it didn't really fit in anywhere else, um, biodiversity, extremely important, but it's like a supporting service to all the other services. So this is how the RIVM models the world. And if you want to look at happiness, uh, which was the main reason why I got my job, you first need to look at these ecosystems because if you look at, for instance, the three things that really touch humans, the physical health, the mental health, and safety, and you look at all the ecosystem services that come with that, then it's pretty much all of them. Not all of them, by the way, three are missing, but pretty much all of those ecoservices are linked to our personal physical health and mental health. So, um, we talked about tree huggers, and I don't know about you, but uh, I've been called a tree hugger quite a bit, and uh, very often people meant that in a, a bit of a negative way. Um, there's a, there is some tree hugger is a bit of a, uh, a dirty word, I suppose, out there, uh, but uh, you can simply tree, hug that tree and you do it for yourself because it's really healthy to look after green. Yeah? You can simply do that for the benefit of, of ourselves. We can be egocentric and still do green. So if you look at those ecosystems, uh, ecosystem services, then there's actually another level, another layer of, of uh, complexity to look at. Because a tree um, takes up a certain um, strategy. Uh, for instance, it can go high up in the, into the air because it is competing for light. Or it doesn't because there is enough light and it goes into, it, 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 uh, it um, enforces its root structure so that it's better uh, aimed at stress mitigation, or it defends, it, it, it creates a defense against uh, 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 plagues and, and, and all other uh, biological disturbances, especially plagues. It's like um, there is uh, limited uh, resources, uh, limited amounts of uh, energy, and where should the tree put that energy in? Um, the tree can decide for itself, basically. And um, if you, you need to model these things, otherwise you can't really tell what ecosystem comes out of it. To give you an example, I was talking about cooling. The cooling is because of two things, and one of the most important ones is shade. A tree provides shade and therefore cooling. But if you want to model shading, then you need to know the height of the tree. And you also need to know how much bigger it will get. And for that to know, you need to know which, which uh, strategy it will take. Otherwise, you can't really model all these things. So that links into all sorts of stuff that you also need to model. Otherwise, you can't really look at the ecosystem services in a, in a good way. And um, the longer you start thinking about it, the more comes along with it. Basically, you need to model all these elements uh, to say something about the ecosystem uh, service that it provides. So these are the functions of a tree. And then, um, so, so we sort of have now three different layers, holistic layers of, of modeling society uh, or modeling, modeling uh, the benefits of, of green for, uh, for our uh, uh, environment. Um, and one thing we didn't really talk about yet, and that is actually the tree itself. So if we look at, um, here we've got these three layers. Okay, yeah, let me put that up. So, and they are sort of linked together from, from the function of a tree down to the ecosystem service, and from the ecosystem service down to the values that it has to humans and back. And then we're missing the actual tree in this whole story. So what, what, what we lacked doing and why I still have a job in this company is because 
basically, first you need to find out where all the trees are. Otherwise, there's no point in talking about the, the effect that it has on, on nature and on, uh, it, on, on, on the combination on society and on people if you don't know where the trees are. So that's like, like another layer of complexity that we add. So what we need before anything else is like a ledger or a cadaster uh, with um, um, a good overview of where the current trees are. And that's actually what we're doing right now. So we have the, we're still aiming at modeling uh, the happiness of people. We first need to start with finding all the trees. So what we did, um, unfortunately, I would almost say, this is not, not a cup of tea or our, our prim primary business, but um, just to be able to monitor all these other things and just to be able to, to model all these other things, we started building up a database with all the trees and we call it the BOMA monitor or tree monitor. And uh, so we have this database with all the trees in the Netherlands, Flanders, North Rangers, um, and beyond, because we can do it in other parts of the world as well, but nobody asks us for it, so we don't do that just yet. And uh, this is not about happiness or anything, this is just about getting as, as accurate as possible. How many trees are there? How big are they? Uh, how tall are they? Where are, where's the root structure? Uh, what is the species? And stuff like that. And we do that through time so that we can actually monitor if things get worse or if things get better. Um, it's, it's relatively down to earth, but if you don't have that, then there's no point in talking about the rest. So we tried, we started thinking about this back in 2013. And uh, there was this cooperation between Wageningen University, Neo, Giordan, and Cobra. And the whole idea was to set up uh, a company called Boomlehisse to find all the trees in the Netherlands. And um, in two years later, it was, was sort of completed, um, but it had some issues. It was really cool, don't get me wrong, it was really a cool data set, but it had some issues. And if I zoom in a bit, you can see about these issues. And, Immediately, you also see an application for this database. That red line going from, from left to right is a high tension line. And if trees start to grow and they, they start almost touching the high tension line, then at some point you will get fireworks and, and a burnt forest and everything. So you don't want that. You, you want to monitor the trees underneath the uh, high tension lines. Um, and we have this database with all the trees. So one of the things that was, it wasn't actual, so it was very often, very often you will look at, at trees that were six years old and perhaps already um, fell. In. It wasn't complete uh, and the geometry was weird and that is probably the, the hardest part. Um, you see here trees and you can already, of course a tree is never perfectly circular, that, that is obvious, but these trees are really weird. Um, and you can also see that line going from, from north to south, um, that was a tile, uh, we, we would process it per tile and at the, at the border of the tile you would get all these artifacts. So that was a bit stupid. It was really cool back then, but we're, luckily we're five years further down the road. So out of this came a new ID and that was to generate the BOMA monitor. And now we don't use one source, but we use 12 different sources to, to look at trees through time. And you see, an overview of all these sources here. I won't go over all of them, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, I'll focus in on a few of them. So the first one is this one. Um, you see at the bottom of this screen, a, a quad. And on top of the quad, there is a laser scanner. And this laser scanner rotates and scans all the trees that it drives past. And I think it sends out like a two million dots per, uh, per, per second, and it scans the tree. So what you will get is a point cloud, a point cloud describing the shape of the tree. And at the same time, we will also take pictures. We're looking at one of these pictures right now. So we've got the combination of the point cloud describing the form and shape, and we've got these pictures describing the color and those type of things. And out of that combination, you can find very accurate tree information. Uh, it's probably one of the most accurate ways to, 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 um, to measure trees and to, to see what the, um, uh, the shape and size and everything. Um, the only problem with this approach is that it's, it's not, you can't really scale this up to all of the Netherlands. You can't drive around with a quad all through the Netherlands. That's impossible. So you can only do that for um, areas of interest, um, a certain lane, um, a certain neighborhood perhaps, but you can't, 
it's it's um, way too expensive to do this for a whole municipality or a whole country. So what we use for that is aerial photographs, and what you see here is, is uh, one of the same aerial photographs. We use two. We use stereo uh, imagery, and just like with two trees, you can you can uh, see depth uh, using two aerial photographs. Stereo photographs, you can see heights. And you see that on the right. And so this is part of the uh, Groningen province. And frankly, I can't remember which village this particularly is. Uh, but as you can see, it's really flat. And then you've got this village and it, it sticks out, basically. So it's no longer um, um, a photograph. It's, it's, it became something like a, like a hologram, I might say. And although it is slightly more difficult than that, um, uh, just to visualize what we do, we now search for all the red hills. Every single red hill is a tree. And the good thing about this is that it's, these aerial photographs are available every single year. For that reason, we can, we, uh, we can update the database every year. And it works all over the Netherlands and Flanders and North and Westfalen in Germany. So that's a cool source to, uh, to do analysis on. Um, that was on the, um, in the outskirts or, or uh, it wasn't clearly it wasn't a, a city area so just to prove the point this is in a city area and just to prove another point it doesn't just work in Holland this is in Belgium in Antwerp uh, people visiting the city probably saw this train station at the at the bottom or on the left um, it's the train station of Antwerp and right next to it is the zoo and as you can see each and every tree uh, becomes yeah, like a little hill and you can search for those hills and find all the trees. Another source that we use is satellite imagery. So this is the, I won't, normally I will ask my audience, does, does anyone know which city this is? But I'll keep it simple now. This is the city of Zwolle. And um, um, well, you can see here in, in red tones and obviously those trees are not really as red as they are, as you can see them here. This is because we look at infrared. And uh, so trees are green, don't worry. Uh, but since we use infrared for this, it all pops up in a red tone. Um, so satellite images are not sharp enough, I might say, to, to really depict where the tree starts and where it ends. But once you know that there is a tree out of the aerial photographs that I've just shown, um, you can track and trace it through time. And because that's the good thing about satellite images, they are available every single five days. So if there is a storm and uh, trees are falling over, or if somebody illegally cuts a tree or something like that, then we can find it using satellite images. Another thing that you can see here is that uh, these trees have all of a red color, but the, the, the red shade is all different. And so it goes from orange to, to pink, to deep red, a bit grayish sometimes, or brownish. And that sounds, says something about the species. So this helps us to define the species of, of trees in the end. Okay, I mentioned that we use 12 uh, data sets, but I'll, this one is the last one that I show. So these are point clouds, and what we generated is an algorithm to automatically find the tree stems. In red, you see the, the points that are reflected from the tree stems. And then in green, you see the foliage uh, on top of the stems, basically. We also depict the bare earth, and then there, is, there are remaining points, the black ones in this particular case. And these black ones are basically describing the undergrowth. Now, we haven't really cut, get, gotten this, this far that we already take a close look at the undergrowth, but uh, basically we, we subdivided the point cloud into, into different parts, which allows us to do so uh, at a later time. But for now, we use this information, especially for the stem position, the stem diameter, stem length and also the direction of the stem because this is something that keeps we keep wondering about um, of course a tree grows up that's quite obvious and every tree is different but on average does a tree grow in a southern direction to catch as much sunlight as possible or does it grow in northeastern direction because of the uh, predominant uh, winds we have no clue we, we really have no clue so what we'll do is we'll simply measure the, the direction of the stem in, for all the trees in the Netherlands, and then run some uh, cool statistics on it to see, um, well, what is the, the average uh, direction of a tree stem. 
Okay, let's talk about all those uh, sources. It's just to give you an impression of uh, what comes into this. And the result is something like this. So it's a map. It's a, it's a map with all trees. Each and every individual tree is on it, and each and every individual tree in this particular case has a color based on its height. So the red or reddish trees are high, and the green ones are low, and we measure this every single year. Okay. So I'm almost done with uh, the capturing of trees, and then we can look at uh, why we use them or what we use them for. But first, to finish that off, what, what do we currently capture? So what we capture is the position of the top of the tree. So it's not so much the height of the tree, because we capture that as well, but where is the top? And uh, we, we thought that might be interesting for the Air Force, actually, so that we, uh, they wouldn't fly their F-16 fighter jets into, into uh, trees. Uh, but uh, they are not interested, so they just want the height. But anyway, yeah, we, we calculate the position nonetheless. So we calculate the stem position. Where is the tree? We calculate the tree crown projection, tree coverage. And we also calculate a so-called stability cloth. So it's a tree root structure. And of course, this root structure goes, goes pretty far, uh, normally further than the tree crown projection. But if you cut it off uh, within reason, then the tree has not much issues with it. It will still grow and still uh, continue to grow. But if you come too close, if you, if you cut off too much, then it will die. And that's what they refer to as the stability cloth. So if you stay out of the stability cloth, then the tree can, can, can live on. Um, so we try to model that. And of course, you can't see it. You can't measure it. But we model it. Yeah. Just when you start digging is the first time that you can actually measure it. But until then, we, uh, we model it. And then we have a security parameter, parameter around the tree. Uh, basically, there should not be any construction work within the safety parameter. Um, ideally, there is no construction work within the safety parameter. And then in reality, that's impossible. We still need to enter the safety parameter every now and then. But at least we'll know where and uh, take measures. Yeah, that's the whole idea behind it. OK, so that's what we do with every tree. And then, uh, yeah, I already mentioned the diameter of the crown, diameter of the stem, stem length, crown volume, uh, angles. Yes, we talked about that. And um, uh, Dr. McGee already talked about um, uh, eye tree. So we use eye tree as well uh, to calculate the air pollution capture, CO2 sequestration, uh, the resulting emission rights that, that are being saved. Um, all these things are being measured and, and uh, no, not, this is not measured, this is modeled. This, these things are modeled. We also model the tree type. So yeah, so I think that's, uh, oh no, there's two slides away. So ultimately, we collect four, uh, 54 items uh, for all the trees in the Netherlands, and I gave it away here. We think there are 100 million trees in, in the Netherlands. And Dr. McGee just asked about the, the number of trees in uh, Groningen. I have a different number, actually, so we should have a look at uh, the difference between the two, but we'll talk about that later. So there's 54 different items that we measure for each and every tree. Um, um, Measure, I said measure again. Some of the things are measured and most of them are modeled. More precise about that. And uh, not uninteresting or very important actually is that we give each tree a name. So the, 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 the I would almost say weird thing is that roughly six million trees in, in Holland um, are, are municipal trees. So uh, it's the municipality that is in, you know, um, responsible for them. Um, and of course, they probably know which tree they planted where. And they, have a, they have a list of that, or they have a database of that. But that's about 6 million trees, and then there's like 94% of the trees that are simply out there anonymously. So they stand in somebody's back garden, or they stand in the forest, or they stand somewhere outside of the city center. And nobody really knows what type of tree that is. So clearly, this is the right time to solve that issue, because we think it is an issue. We, need to, we wish to know what type of tree is where. And where we stand currently is that we can predict tree species with an average accuracy of 70%. So for certain, and that's species dependent, so certain species we can, we can we have an, we do reach an accuracy of like 96%. That's really accurate. But then there's also some species that uh, we have an accuracy of 0.3%. So we totally suck at that. But on average, for every single tree in the Netherlands, we reach an accuracy of 70%, which is quite, quite acceptable, I think. 
already, and we're still improving that because it's not good enough for some of the applications. But once you know the species, then you know uh, the all these other things, uh, which we come to in a minute. I thought the next slide would be on that. Ah, my bad. So once we have all these parameters, then we can also present them in 3D. Um, and frankly, I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a stupid thing. We've got these discussions um, very often. And okay, we, we can we can do it in 3D. Oh, cool. But, but why? Who, who's who's who would want to have that? And frankly, I don't know. So here's a link. It's public. You can go to that as well. It's nederlandsin3d.nl slash cobra. And if I click on it and I give a tiny little mini, mini demo, I hope. And I think I shared my screen and not the application. So you should be able to see this one as well. Um, so this is the municipality of Arnhem. I zoom out a bit. Um, here's the old center. Um, in the south, and then there's this gigantic park called Somsbeek Park, um, very close to the to the city centre. And if you zoom in, then you will see all the trees in that park in 3D. Um, unfortunately, this viewer only shows you the trees in Arnhem, not in Kronia. Uh, stupid, huh? But um, yeah, we've got these, all these individual trees, and if I click on them, then it will give me information like how much CO2 has been sequestered in it, uh, how deep is the cloth, uh, all these, these type of things. The economical value of that tree, uh, purely from a CO2 point of view, by the way, uh, that's all stored in there. Now, watching stuff in 3D is very consuming for my laptop, and you might hear it because my microphone is right next to the exit of my Laptop. So I close this down immediately and I should keep doing the, the buzz of my, my laptop. So I can go back to rest now. So that's cool, that's nice, um, but that's nice to have. Huh? So we, we've got some sort of a ledger of all the trees in the Netherlands, or in Western Europe, I would almost say. Uh, what do you use it for? What do municipalities use it for mostly? Because we're not using it, uh, well, we, we do use it ourselves, but mostly we use it for municipalities. And one of the things we use it for is this, it's a B tree index. So what we did here is that per cell, and it's, a, it's a tiny little hexagon. You thought that was funny or I don't know. Yeah, uh, so B tree index per cell, we calculate the number of trees, but not just that. We also calculate which trees are, uh, which the, the, the species are under there. Uh, because then if you know the species, then you can, extract information on when there will be pollen, when it will blossom, when there will be blossom and everything. So you know when there will be food for, for bees and for butterflies and for insects. Um, because in July, everything is, is blossoming. So July is really not an issue for, for uh, insects and for, for bees. It's mostly at the start and the end of the growing season that they have a, a hard time finding food. So if you have certain tree species that blossom at the start or at the end of the of the season and suddenly that becomes a very attractive place for a bee to be in it's almost like a small little habitat and with green colors you can see all the yeah the, the bee habitats basically now if you would want to combine these habitats into one bigger habitat then it's um, it's possible by simply adding one or two particular trees that blossom very early or very late in the year and then you've got some sort of like a like a stepping stone linking habitats to one another um, and thereby making the, the habitat a lot um, more sustainable basically. So analysis like this are possible. We do this for municipalities that basically how we, uh, how, how we, how we um, pay for all the uh, work on uh, finding all the trees. Um, and we can do this because we know where all the trees are, we know the species, and for that reason we know when it blossoms and that enables us to do these types of analysis. And well, how does it fit in with uh, uh, the, the um, ecosystem? Uh, it's, of course, this is about pollination, it's about biodiversity, and it's not, not uninteresting, it's about plague suppression. So we've got a lot of issues, uh, I'm not sure about throwing it, but I guess it's the same over there, with the uh, oak caterpillar, the oak processionary caterpillar, um, and uh, how do you how do you make sure that this this animal doesn't appear as much as it has been appearing over the last two years? 
is by um, enabling a better biodiversity and so that that in itself suppresses plagues. So this is important. It's important to do these types of analysis and make that work. Here's another um, uh, reason or another uh, uh, application for the BOMA monitor that we use. And this is for the municipality of Arnhem. We did something comparable for the municipality of Kronia, but uh, this one is um, better thought out. So I'll show you this one. Um, so yeah, we talked about, um, uh, you can look at the number of trees, but that is less interesting than the, the tree crown area or tree coverage. Ideally, you should go one step further, actually, and have a look at the tree volume, because really, in the end, the volume of, of, of tree foliage, that is a better measure for biodiversity, for the cooling effect of trees, for all sorts of other things. The problem with tree volume is that it's very hard to quantify because you look, or we at least look from, from above, we can't really, we, we see the, the top of the tree, we know exactly where it ends on the top, but we don't really know where it ends at, at the bottom. So we can't really accurately model the tree volume, not, not, not in, on a large scale at least. So the second best is then to look at the, the, the tree crown area. Um, but for some reason, if you ask a mayor, okay, what about the trees? Then they will start about the number of trees. So we do that analysis as well. Um, and the result of that uh, is like the graph that you see in the lower right corner. Uh, this is for one particular neighborhood, the neighborhood of Schaarsbergen in the north of uh, Arnhem. And this is the, uh, the, the, the number of trees per hectare. And then you see that from 2006 up to 2011, there was a, a significant increase in the number of trees. Um, and then it sort of, uh, well, when dead, it was uh, it's, it's stable or slightly decreasing perhaps even. Uh, but um, the um, municipality changed their legislation regarding trees in 2015. And they were quite concerned that changing the legislation would do a lot to the number of trees. And we can't find that. So that they were quite pleased with this graph because there is no, uh, no, no trend analysis or no change in trend in 2015. Now, if you have a look at the number of trees and the, uh, the, the tree cover, uh, the two tiny, the two thematic maps at the top uh, depict those two. Um, they describe the same time period from 2011 to 2018. There's no difference there. The difference is in the number on the left or the area on the right. And what you see is that in some neighborhoods, there is a significant decrease in the number of trees. Uh, but at the same time, let's say 10, 10 trees are missing, something like that. But the other 1,000 trees are still growing. And uh, because of that growing, the area might still increase, although the number of trees decreases. Not always, huh? as you can see, uh, in some neighborhoods, it's red on both sides or a, a red tint at least. Um, but you can see that there are some differences. There are some neighborhoods that are, the number of tree, trees increases and the area as well, uh, the number decreases in the area as well, but sometimes it's not that, that obvious and uh, it's more, uh, more uh, interesting than that. Um, we, we did this because there was a lot of, there were a lot of complaints by citizens in Arnhem. They complained that there was a lot of um, a, a lot of decrease in the number of trees, and frankly, I think they were right. And yeah, the, the map on the left shows that they do have a point. Um, but yes, it's it's not every not everything was horrible because at least the area was still increasing, although in most municipalities, I need to say. So why can we do stuff like this? Because we know where all the trees are, and we know it every single year. Yeah, for that reason, we can have these trends and see how, the, how that changes through time. How does it fit in with the ecosystem services? Um, of course, this helps for the symbolic value, sound and wind visual, cooling effect, cleaning power. Um, yeah, as the number of trees are decreasing, then clearly uh, something is wrong. And that, that touches us as humans in our identity, in the image of the city, and the value of our land. And so there's, there's many reasons why this is important to track and monitor. Now, an extra, we talked about iTree already, it was, it, it was mentioned uh, at least twice now. So if I look at the municipality of Groningen, this is a, a map of Groningen, 
and I zoomed in on your campus, the Zermeke campus, because that is also one particular CBS neighborhood. So CBS is the Dutch Statistics Bureau. And uh, they recognized Zermeke campus as one particular neighborhood. And um, apparently 10 people live there. I have no clue. I, I would have expected zero people would live there, but apparently there are 10, 10 inhabitants. Um, and, and this is something that they don't know, but we do, there are 4,937 trees um, within the campus grounds or at least within the whole neighborhood. Now, the average number of trees per inhabitant in Holland is 6.18. So every, every single person has 6.18 trees, uh, basically. And obviously in, tree, in, in cities that is slightly less, and if you go to the Veluwe, it's slightly more. Uh, but uh, the Zanike campus scores extremely high because there's only 10 inhabitants and there's 4,000 trees. So that's 409, uh, 40, uh, 94 trees per inhabitant. That's a bit unfair, of course, because perhaps 10 people live there, but thousands of people, thousands of students and, and professors come there. So these 4,937 trees capture 8,780 cubic meters of water every year so that's precipitation coming down and the tree will take it up it will not fl flow immediately to the sewer system causing havoc over there uh, it will simply yeah the, the trees will will solve that issue basically same thing with the fine dust and the particle matter 2.5 which is the smallest uh, uh, amount i think the smallest uh, particles these small particles really go deep into your lungs you can't really cough them out anymore um, and they cause uh, lung cancer, cancer, basically. And uh, the good thing is that uh, 30 kilograms of that stuff is captured by the trees, and, and uh, you don't have to cough it out anymore because you don't, you're not breathing it in in the first place. So that's pretty cool. Um, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and then we end up with CO2, which is a, an interesting one in this particular list because the rest is captured. It simply, let's say, glues to the leaves, and then it, uh, it washes away with the next... Uh, rain comes. CO2 doesn't. Uh, CO2 is really captured or sequestered by the trees and it's, it's what makes the tree grow. So um, 128,000 kilograms of CO2 is being captured by those 4,000, almost 5,000 trees. And of course, they, per year, per year I need to add, and of course they stand there longer than one year. So during their lifetime, they captured more than 5 million kilograms of CO2. Um, should you cut down these trees and burn them, you need to pay. You need to pay for the uh, emission. Uh, uh, yeah, the emission. Uh, how do you call them? Yeah, the emission. You need to pay for the emission, and that links that it makes it, that enables us to link CO two kilograms to money, and those five million kilograms of CO two would represent a value of almost two million euros. Now, these trees represent a higher value than that. This is just about the CO2 part within there. So this is iTree. Uh, Dr. McGee already uh, told us about that. Uh, she mentioned that you can calculate it per tree, which is true, but since we know all those trees, we can immediately do that for all the trees and bundle it together and get, get information per, per neighborhood about it. So that's what iTree brings us and the bone monitor and the combination between the two. How does that fit in with the ecosystem value and, and the human values? Well, clearly, uh, this, this helps us. This helps us a lot. This, this improves our physical health, and it does so by through carbon sequestration, water storage, and the cleaning power of urban green. Okay, I think the last example, and then I will move onwards, is about heat and vegetation. And there is a link between the two. Uh, this is a heat map and we can measure and we, we actually do measure the uh, heat from satellite images and if, if you put in a, a layer with all the trees then you will see that there is a certain relationship and this relationship is very complex it's not as simple as i simply plant a tree and simply uh, the temperature drops by one degree i wish it was but it isn't that simple um, it's even sometimes the other way around that you plant trees and it gets hotter not always, luckily, but it does happen. So it's a complex relationship, and we're really trying to figure out what the relationship exactly is between the two. But yes, it does provide normally at least a cooling effect, and of course that is very good for humans as well. 
um, if you look at all of the Netherlands, this is a surface temperature map from 2016. And it almost looks like a topographic map. As in, uh, the cities are red and the sea is blue, but it's not a topographic map. It's a heat map. So cities are warm and the sea is cold. That's basically what you're looking at. So you see all the cities and they are extremely hot compared to the areas around them. But if you move to 2017 and afterwards one further to 2018, then um, you don't see the, tr the, the cities that uh, well anymore. And I can guarantee you that they are still hot. But the rest is, has gotten a lot hotter as well. So it's especially, you're almost looking at the soil map right now because what you see as hot areas are the east and the south of Holland. That's the sandy area. Yeah? Those are the higher grounds, the sandy areas. Um, and those are simply because of lack of water. That's basically what we're looking at right now. Because of a lack of water, you see that the, the, the heat, the, there's been a heat shift uh, to, to the east and to the south. So it's no longer just the cities that are hot. It's basically what it says here. Of course, I had to look, uh, zoom into to Groningen as well. So this is the, the center of Groningen. Um, at the bottom, you see the train station, a very hot area. And then you cross the single, which is really cool. And then you come into the city center, and then it's really hot again. Uh, now, if you see that that's sort of like circular central area at the, let's say, the northeast part of the central area, you can see the, the Martini Tower. The Martini, well, you can't really see the tower, but you see the area where the, the, the church is. And behind that, you see this dark green area, which is the Martini Kerkhof. And you can also see the corresponding temperatures in, in red tones. And what you can see is that that area re is really like the air conditioner for the whole city, for the, for the inner city at least. Um, that's the, the coolest place by far in the whole city. Now, unfortunately, the rest of the city doesn't really um, um, reap the benefits from it. Uh, it's still hot over there. But if you want to go to a nice place, then you have to go over there. That's, that's quite obvious. And so are the singles, by the way. And the North Park uh, on the upper left corner uh, is also a very nice and cool area to be in. Okay, so that's what it's used for. Is it accurate? Because that's always a question that I get, so I'll quickly go over that. So this is the Stadtpark in the south, what is it, southwest of the city in 2017. And what you see here is, of course, in red tones again, because we look at the infrared spectrum, is um, a lot of trees and, and some, some, some fields, some grass. At the bottom, you can see um, probably a football field, and it's black because it's not, it's not uh, real grass, it's, it's, a, it's an artificial grass. So that's in 2017. If I continue to 2018, then it looked like this. It was devastated, and uh, the devastation has nothing to do with the municipality. It has all to do with the fact that it was so extremely dry. It was an extremely incredibly dry year. And a lot of vegetation died that year. I'll go back one slide just to give you an appreciation for the difference again. So this was 2017. Everything really, um, uh, yeah, yeah, lush and, and happy, basically. And then one year later, uh, this was the result. There are some differences. Uh, so the municipality did one or two things, but uh, the overall impression is that uh, a lot of trees died that year, and not just the trees. And you can also see that the grass uh, is in very poor shape. Um, so it was extremely, it was a horrendous year for vegetation, basically. And 2019 has been slightly better, but not much. And the trees are still recuperating and still, still trying to cope with uh, the, the damage that was done in 2018. 2020, we still don't know. It was very wet at the start of this year. It looked like a promising start of the year for the vegetation at least. Uh, but now it has been so dry for the last one and a half months that um, I really hope we will get some extra rain because um, uh, yeah, things, things look grim yet again. So that so 2018 was a horrible year and we measured trees, but um, you can see that the trees are, are in a very poor shape. And we did a comparable uh, thing for the municipality of Rotterdam. So we're now looking at the Rotterdam uh, uh, trees, and it, you can recognize the, the river Maas and the Erasmus Brug, the bridge of the Erasmus Bridge. And you can see the trees there on the side. If I zoom in a bit, uh, I had a look at that particular middle tree 
and put it on a PowerPoint slide. So that's the tree. It's the one that we measure. Of course, it is not that uh, rectangular in reality, but that's what we measure. So we have a tree and a centroid. And then we can, uh, we know the area of that tree, which is four square meters and a bit. Now we did this thought experiment with the municipality because the, uh, I need to add that. The municipality has this goal that they want to add within the city region 20 hectares of green. And that's really hard to do because it's a full city. It, basically, there's not 20 hectares left. So what do we do? Where do we get that, that space from? How do we do that? So they want to monitor exactly how much, how much extra green they have in the city. So we did a thought experiment. Let's just say that we generalize this tree to a circle because we know the area. Uh, so we can calculate the radius based on that. And then we, we've got a circle. Now just imagine that simply because it's not 2018 and it's extremely dry, but it's 2019 and the tree is more happier again. So it just grows by one centimeter. That's not much, right? One centimeter. Um, yeah, one centimeter is nothing. Um, but if we would do that, and um, it would do that for all one million trees in Rotterdam, what would happen? What is the, the difference in area? Um, and of course, this is just a thought experiment. When meantime, trees will go away, new trees will be planted, uh, the trees in the forest can't grow by one centimeter. And so, uh, this is uh, have we, yeah, it's just a thought experiment and nothing else. But just imagine the trees will grow by one centimeter, and then all one million trees will do that. And what if they grow five centimeters, which is still nothing? What what is the effect? And here you see a tiny little thing. So currently, there's 28 million square meters of tree cover. So that's 2,850 hectares. Adding just one centimeter, which is nothing, already adds 12 hectares. If it would grow by five centimeters, we've got 60 hectares extra tree cover. And uh, just to remind you, the goal was to add 20, 20 hectares of, of green. So simply being nice to your trees, giving them water twice a week, uh, will do enough. That's enough to, to, to make, to, to, for Rotterdam to, to reach its goals. Um, which is also, at the same time, and the, the, Dr. McGee already mentioned that, uh, that the, the tree cover is a very important measure, but um, it's, it's not the final measure. There's more to say about it because it's, it's so uh, fluid in a sense. Okay, so full circle, I'll uh, wrap up because I need to. So the thing that we do is we really want to measure how happy people are because of the green, but what we're actually doing is by building a ledger. We build this ledger with all the trees that are available. And out of that come all the, the functions that the trees uh, um, form or, or, or provide to the city. And out of that come the different ecosystem services. And out of that come the different uh, values that they have for humans. Um, so we're far away from that. <laughs> Basically, what we're after is, is modeling this, this, this red circle, but we, we can't really do that. So where do we stand currently? Because that's the goal that we have, but we're not doing it. Where do we stand? Well, this ledger thing, uh, I think we're pretty pretty okay with that. I mean, it can always improve, of course, but this, we're, we're pretty okay with that. Um, then the next thing is to how do you measure all the functions of a tree? Uh, we're quite good at that as well in the meantime. Some of them are really super, some are still we still need to have a look at that. So if you have that, you can say something about the ecosystem services. And frankly, I think we, we've covered about 10% of that, especially the CO2 uh, sequestration and, and uh, the cooling effect of trees is something that we work on hard. But as you can see, there are 18 of these dots, and uh, I mentioned two. So we still have a long way to go. And if once we have that, then we can say something about the happiness and the safety and then the value that it has to, to people. Um, this is really on our to-do list and on our wish list, but uh, we're not there yet. 